This is Reverend Kirk Lawton, minister at Ocean Lakes Family Campground, and this is our podcast. Our prayer is that this message may enrich your life as you find God especially meaningful to you. Thank you for worshiping with us. Good morning. We welcome you to our podcast of the Sunday morning service from Ocean Lakes Family Campground on this Sunday, July the 19th. The scriptural verse, key verse for the message today is John chapter 14, verse 6, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The title of the sermon is A Highway and a Low. We trust that this time will be a blessing to you today. One of the subjects which young preachers study while in the seminary is called homiletics. This is a study of sermons and their proper preparation. During the course of this study, one of the requirements is that each person must preach a sermon before the entire class. A standing joke among preachers is that of the young fellow who got up before his class and began his sermon with these words. If I had a text for this sermon, well, that's not the way to begin a sermon. Our professor said that we are to have a text, a biblical basis for what we have to say in a sermon. That's a good principle to follow, I believe. This keeps a preacher from giving only a general discourse on good living without resorting to his authority the Bible, the Word of God. Now, having said all that, let me begin. If I had a text for this sermon, (laughs) well, I've already broken the rule, haven't I? But my problem is not that there's no biblical text for what I have to say. My problem is that there are so many texts until I have trouble deciding on only one. Now, if you want to pick just one, you might go with John 14, verse 6. That's a real good one. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we're thinking this morning about the way. But look how many other Bible verses refer to this. Psalm 27, verse 11. Teach me thy way, O Lord. Psalm 86, verse 11. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. Psalm 119, verse 30, I have chosen the way of truth. In Matthew 22, verse 16, the Pharisees said to Jesus, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God and truth. And on and on we could go. In the concordance to one of the Bibles I use, there are 73 additional references to the way. Yes, this sermon today is biblically based. No question about that. But actually the title I'm using comes from a poem by John Oxenham. These are the words of his poem. To every man there openeth a way, ways, and a way. And the high soul takes the high way, but the low soul gropes the low. And in between on the misty flats, the rest drift to and fro. But to every man there openeth a highway and a low, and every man decideth the way his soul shall go. These verses, along with so many verses in the Bible, suggest that each one of us has a choice in how we shall live our lives. Dr. Roy Angel, in his book, The Price Tags of Life, has a sermon on the electives of life. And in this sermon, he likens our lives to a school wherein each of us have some required courses, that's subjects we must take, but also we have some courses that we may take or leave. These are called electives. One thing is we can choose our way of life. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told about two gates one of which we all must enter. These are his words from Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. I'm reading from the contemporary English version now. 
Jesus said, go in through the narrow gate. The gate to destruction is wide and the road that leads there is easy to follow. A lot of people go through that gate, but the gate to life is very narrow. The road that leads there is so hard to follow that only a few people find it. We must all go through one of these gates. Death is one of the required courses for all of us in the school of life. That is, unless our Lord returns to the earth first. God is not going to force us to go through either of these two gates, though. The choice is ours. Russell Conwell told of an incident from his own life which illustrates how true this is. Here's the way he tells it. My father bought a farm in New England. We all went up to build a new home on it. The site my father selected was close to the river and a beautiful piece of bottom land. He had hardly started the foundation when some of his neighbors came and told him that he was building his house in the wrong place. They said that he should not build his house in the bottom land, as beautiful as it was, but rather they said it should be, their words, above the snake line. He didn't know what that meant, so they explained it to him. They said in the spring, the hundreds of snakes come down with the little streams. You better build your home above the snake line. Russell Conwell went on to say that very few people deliberately choose the broad way of destruction that Jesus spoke about. And how true that is. No person starts out to be an alcoholic. No one starts out to be a gossip. No one starts out to be an embezzler. But we all do choose our way of life. Some people have obviously chosen a sad, destructive way of life. These are the ones who never seem to have learned what Jesus was talking about when he spoke about these two gates. Oh, how refreshing it is, though, to see someone who has the Spirit of Jesus so indwelling their life that it shines out in all its splendor, spreading joy and beauty to those about them. A young girl once described how, as she rode on a city bus in a very busy city, Another lady came to sit beside her. This lady brought with her a bird cage, a basket of fruit, and quite a few bundles, all of which crowded the young girl almost out of her seat. But as the girl laughingly told about this a bit later, she seemed not to mind at all. Some of her friends said, well, why didn't you tell that woman she was taking more room than her fair share, crowding you out of your seat? Why didn't you stand up for your rights, they asked her. Oh, replied the girl, it really wasn't worth getting upset about. After all, we had such a short distance to go together. What a great motto this could be for our lifelong journey. So many of us are upset by the little annoyances of others. Many small unkindnesses, slights, or hurtful words that others say to us could be overlooked if we could remember that we have only such a short distance to go together. Yes, we can choose our way of life, how we live among others. But there's something else far more important that we can choose. And that is we can choose whether or not to live the Christian life. Living the Christ-like life is not easy. It is impossible at least in our own strength. It is only when Jesus is allowed to come into our hearts, cleanse our sin, forgive us from our self-centeredness, and give us a new direction that we can truly live the Christian life. Many non-Christians do good deeds, be nice to neighbors, they may live a clean moral life, give to charity, and yet not really have a life-changing experience with Jesus. John Maynard tells a story of how he was saved in a very interesting way. Here are his words. I was full of mischief, mixed with some meanness when I was a little boy at school. It was a lot of fun to put a frog in the teacher's desk 
or to bring a pigeon to school under my shirt and then turn it loose in the classroom. I admit I was to blame for some of the teachers leaving in the middle of the school session, and I made it quite hard for the school board to keep a teacher in that little red schoolhouse when I was a boy. Then one day, the miracle happened. A lovely Christian, with a smile and a sense of humor, came to take over this school. She immediately won my heart. My mother and father looked at each other with raised eyebrows when I suddenly began to shine my shoes, wash my face, and comb my hair. Finally, commencement time came. My mother and father received an invitation to come to the exercises. They had never been to that school before. Until now, they were ashamed to go. After the exercises were over, the teacher pointed to a shelf that went around the room and she said to the parents, the children's work is arranged alphabetically. If you want to take a look at it, you may. John said, I hung my head when I thought of that workbook with my name on it. Before this teacher came, I had written on it upside down and crosswise and had put a few pictures here and there. And finally, I peeped up to see mother and father looking at my workbook, and my face went crimson red. To my astonishment, there were no frowns on their faces. My parents were smiling. Dad had his arm around mother's shoulders, and apparently they were delighted. When they moved away, I slipped over and looked at the workbook myself. Lo and behold, Someone had cut out all the ugly pages, leaving only my best. About then I felt an arm around my shoulders, and I looked up to see this beautiful Christian teacher. With a smile, she asked, John, do you know who taught me how to do that? When I shook my head, she answered her own question. Jesus taught me. And then she asked, if I didn't want Jesus to wipe out all the ugly thin things in my past life and forgive me for them, that was when I gave my life to Christ. Now one final thought. So many of us have a misconception of what it means to become a Christian. They seem to think that you become this little saint who goes around on tiptoes, never having any fun in life or any joy. That is really a perversion of what Jesus brings to a person. He said he came to bring us life and that more abundantly. Living the abundant life does not mean becoming totally sinless thereafter. No, we all continue to be like lost wayward sheep. But the desire of our heart when Christ lives within us is that we have a different intention, a new purpose. We will not continue to enjoy living in those things that hurt God. Russell Hensley of Berea, Kentucky, tells about this fellow in a little rural church congregation who would, as he said, get religion every time they had a revival meeting. And then a few days later, he'd be right back in his old lifestyle until the next revival. After about six times in the baptismal place in the river, the preacher put him under, raised him up and said, you've been baptized so much that the fish in this river know you by your first name. <laughs> well, surely that's not the way that Jesus was talking about. Writing in the little devotional booklet, Our Daily Bread, Bill Crowder tells of a family visit to Disneyland where he saw a sign over the entrance which read, welcome to the happiest place on earth. The rest of the day he looked at the faces of people and was impressed by the small number of folks who were actually smiling during their visit to the happiest place on earth. The life that Jesus came to bring us is a quality of life that continues even in the midst of difficult days such as we're in these days. Many people have found the meaning of life and special meaning in life under very trying circumstances. 
An old song says, life goes on long after the thrill of living is gone. Yes, we find meaning, purpose, peace, and a real sense of fulfillment when Christ is allowed to be for us the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus came to bring us life, abundant living, full and free. Trusting Him to save and keep us gives us joy the world can see. Will you pray with me? Oh God, thank you so much for Jesus who is the way, the truth, and the life. And when we decide to follow Jesus, we know that he gives to us that special kind of life that we so all want very much. Help us, Lord, this day to be willing to surrender ourselves to his lordship and thereby let him come truly the Lord of our lives. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.